morning again, and welcome to the Leaders to Legend Breakfast. Uh, I'm Steve Sufchuk. I'm the Associate Dean in charge of undergraduate programs and an accounting guy here. Uh, and it is my distinct privilege today to welcome you all. Uh, this is the last Leaders to Legends Breakfast of the 2015-2016 year. And of course, we've saved the best for last. That's what we do. Uh, I'm here today representing uh, our boss, our distinguished boss, Jim Giambalvo, who will be traveling to China and asked me to uh, thank you all for coming. Christina is a physicist. Let me introduce her first and, and then maybe tell you a little bit about her. Actually, I should have, uh, should have uh, given you her name, although I know you're here to see her. Uh, this is Christina Lomazny. Uh, please welcome her. Let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a physicist, co-founder, president, and CEO of Maja Metal. That's a company committed to realizing the full potential of a new class of nano-laminated materials, uh, specifically metals. Through her leadership, Maja Metal team has spearheaded a technological breakthrough that produces ultra-high performance metals that defy the performance limitations of materials as we know them today not only on an industrial scale, but at a cost that is competitive with conventional homogeneous metals. Maja Metal has recognized the impact of this breakthrough technology in major industries such as energy, transportation, propulsion, and construction. Uh, others have actually recognized Maja Metal for the importance of their work. In fact, in 2012, Maja Metal was selected as one of Zero Week's energy innovation pioneers. In 2013, Maja Metal was named among the most innovative companies in the city by Seattle's uh, Museum of History and Industry. In 2015, Maja Metal was honored at the World Oil Awards as the winner of the New Horizons Idea Award. And Christina herself comes from a very distinguished and illustrious background. And I'm saying that because she was a husky, all right? Christina got her, uh, wasn't a business student, she got her uh, a bachelor's in physics here at the UW. However, she did take several business classes, including an accounting class. Can you tell I'm an accountant? Uh, and her instructor is here today. He's, he's retired now, but give Bill Wells a round of applause for coming back. Yeah. In addition to being uh, a, a physics major here at the UW, she conducted undergraduate research at the D.T. Schwartz Electrochemistry Group, and later she completed st studies towards a master's uh, in physics. Christina uh, has done many things uh, besides this. In addition, she's worked for Boeing uh, in a variety of capacities. Uh, she has also co-founded a company named Isotron Corporation, which is a composite materials company. There she served as president and CEO through 2006 and currently serves as its chairman. And just recently, and perhaps most impressively, Christina was named one of Fortune Magazine's most pioneering entrepreneurs at the 2015 Most Powerful Women's Conference. So it is my pleasure to introduce Christina to you. Please come up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to, to join you at breakfast this morning. I, um, this is, it's such a privilege. It's a privilege to have the chance to come back to the University of Washington and to share a little bit about how this, this journey has taken shape, because it started right here, uh, for me at least. Um, so what I thought I'd do is tell you a little bit about myself, like how I, how I got to where I am right now. I want to tell you about Maja Metal, because I'm not sure that you've heard about it yet, although invariably you will. Um, because it's a technology that, that I think is ultimately going to touch all of our lives. And then I wanted to share some of the challenges we've been through. So what our journey has been about, and it's a journey that for Maja Metal is still underway. This is not a technology that, or a company or a venture that's been fully proven yet. So we're still in progress, and, uh, and so we've got, we've got a little bit of road behind us, and we've got a lot of road ahead of us. So I'll, I'll share a little bit about what that's going to look like. Um, so first of all, as Steve mentioned, um, I am a Husky. Um, I actually transferred here uh, to the University of Washington. So I, I explicitly traveled out here to be at the University of Washington. This wasn't by chance that I just wound up in Seattle. I started, um, I started out in New Orleans. I am probably the only person in this room that is a Saints fan still to this day. <laughs> 
Um, but I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. And, um, and I am one of uh, six children. I have five brothers. So I grew up in a family that, you know, that believed in football. We played football. We, you know, lived football. I, I, um, I feel it's important, be, and you'll understand why as I go through the presentation, to explain that most of my brothers went to SEC schools. Most of my cousins went to SEC schools. So, um, so unfortunately, they don't understand the Pac-10, but they do understand Southern football. And you'll understand why I feel that's important. But this is really, this is what my life is about. My family, um, my, uh, the boy that I've chosen to, to spend my life with, and, um, and Maja Metal. And that's really, it's really that simple. If I wasn't doing Maja Metal, I, I added a little picture in the corner there just to share with you that that's probably what I would be doing. I think I would be a professional water skier. Um, and and that's, my, that's my fallback plan, although there really isn't a fallback in all of this. So, <laughs> um, so what is Maja Metal? Uh, Maja metal is a metal, and it's, um, it's a material that's really redefining the way we think about metals. So metals are bulk materials, um, and they have certain characteristics that are associated with them. And the performance envelope of that metal defines what we're capable of doing today with parts, with products, with, you know, with, with things that we drive, with airplanes that we fly, with engines that we produce. It's really the limitations of materials that limit our imaginations when it comes to products. And what we're trying to do with Maja Metal is redefine the way we think about materials. We make what's called a nanolaminated alloy, which means we produce layered metals, kind of like metallic plywoods. And by, by that simple shift in architecture, we can do dramatically different things with metals. So we're effectively creating interfaces in materials. And if you think about metals and sort of what they're made up of, um, you, you start to appreciate the significance of that. So a metal is made up of something that has a chemistry to it and a microstructure to it. And those are the only two things you can control in a metal that affect how it behaves. So what you put in the soup and then sort of how you heat it up and cool it down, it's, it's a lot like you know, making a cake in your kitchen. Um, if, you, if you use slightly different chemistries, you're going to get slightly different outputs. If you heat it up and cool it down differently, you're going to get a different microstructure and you're going to get different performance. And that's basically all you can control. And pretty much since the Bronze Age, that's all you've been able to control. So that's, that's where the industry is kind of stagnated. What we're doing with Maja Metal is we're creating this concept of an architecture in the material. So now we can couple dissimilar materials, we can put them together, and we can cause different things to happen in that material that couldn't happen when the material was in a homogeneous state, right? And that means for us uh, things like um, kohler toughening. So we can toughen a material, we can take a really hard material and we can make it tough. So we can take something that, for example, if you could make your car out of it, could both deflect the shopping basket when it sort of like flies into your car. And in the event that that shopping basket is, you know, is thrown at your car really hard, it'll, it'll locally deform. It won't shatter. Has anybody ever tried using a ceramic knife and accidentally dropped it? You see what happens? It's a really hard edge, but the whole thing shatters when it breaks. And it turns out that there are performance trade-offs that we just that we just have to live with because of the way homogeneous materials perform that we don't necessarily have to live with if we can do things like laminating. We can change the thermal conductivity of a material, for example. So the lowest recorded thermal conductivity of any fully dense material that has been recorded in, in history was for a nanolaminated material. It was 40 times lower than the same material in a single crystal state, which is really hard to get, and six times lower than the theoretical limit for the material. Right? And so, oops. And so these are things that we couldn't, we couldn't imagine as possibilities when we were just thinking about homogeneous metals, right? It's just, it's unfathomable that you could achieve something that defies the laws of physics. Of course, it turns out the laws of physics didn't take into account lamination by virtue of just this kind of architecture. It turns out we can dramatically change the corrosion performance of a material by galvanically coupling metals, which in most applications is a really bad thing. You don't want to couple two dissimilar metals together generally, right? One will corrode the other, and all bets are off. But it turns out we can control that in these laminated materials, and we can take something like zinc, 
which is the most commonly used corrosion resistant material in the world. It's about a $30 billion market. Um, and we can make a material out of zinc that lasts 20 times longer. So if you can imagine what that means for your car, what that means for a bridge and infrastructure, it's, these are dramatic changes in performance. Um, and what, so all of these stories actually pre-existed Modumetal. We knew about nanolaminated materials. We knew they existed. We knew what they were capable of. We knew this was a really cool technology. Um, as a matter of fact, here at the University of Washington, a uh, professor in the chemical engineering department had been doing research with these materials, a uh, professor named Dan Schwartz, and he did some of the pioneering re research in nanolayered materials. Uh, he, he investigated different ways of making these materials that would allow them to, to manifest these kinds of really cool properties that we've, we've been able to, to develop or to, to, uh, to observe. The challenge was those processes were really, really hard to scale. They were expensive. And so that meant that the materials were relegated to kind of academic literature, to papers, to dissertations, um, and to very small scale applications. And so that's where Modumetal stepped in. Um, what, we, what we developed was a manufacturing process that allowed us to produce these materials at commercial scale and at a cost that was competitive with conventional metal alloys. So the significance of that is pretty profound. I, um, does anybody know the story of aluminum? That, um, well, so if we had been born <laughs> maybe a couple hundred years ago in the 1850s, aluminum would have been a precious metal. Um, it, it was actually more expensive than gold or silver to produce. And there's a story that um, Emperor, Emperor Napoleon's buttons were actually covered in aluminum because it was, it was so much more prestigious as metals go. That if you went to the palace for dinner and you were the special guest, you got to eat on the aluminum flatware. If you were just sort of everybody else, you ate with the silver, right? And so, and the reason for that wasn't, I mean, it was recognized that aluminum had this incredible strength to weight ratio, that it could be used in industrial applications, that it, that it could, it had much broader potential than was being realized, but it was so expensive to make, right? Until, until a young man came along named Charles Martin Hall that developed an electrolytic manufacturing process for producing aluminum. He reduced the cost of producing aluminum by 200 times in his lifetime. He started a company called originally the Pittsburgh Reduction Company and then ultimately the Aluminum Company of America that we know of today as Alcoa. And he changed an industry. And for a while, Alcoa basically had the monopoly on manufacturing aluminum, right? And if you think about it, there, there are entire industries, industries that, that are really important to our own region that wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for that manufacturing process, right? Can we, can we imagine what would have happened to the aerospace industry if it hadn't been for aluminum, right? We'd still be flying around in cloth airplanes. I don't really think steel would make for a very energy efficient material <laughs> to fly around, right? So I mean, it's a really big deal. And, and that's essentially what Modumetal brought to the nanolaminated materials market, was this ability to produce materials now in, in a cost effective way that we couldn't produce before. And so, oops. And so that's, that's where we are with the, with the Modumetal story. I don't know what happened to my slide here. Oh, yeah. So what that means in terms of industry, I'm just going to go through some of these quickly, um, is also pretty dramatic when you think about economics. So when we talk about materials that can dramatically change the thermal conduct, their thermal conductivities, then we start realizing engines that can run hotter. So today, a turbine cannot run hotter than it does because the materials it's made of will start to melt. We use something called a thermal barrier coating to try to reduce the conductivity of a turbine blade so that it can survive that really hot environment. If materials could operate at higher temperatures, we would be able to run those engines hotter and we'd be able to run them more efficiently. And with the kind of performance characteristics I mentioned that are possible with nanolaminated materials, you could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by a quarter just by virtue of operating those gas turbines at a higher temperature, right? It's a dramatic shift in performance, and it's a really big impact. 
When you start thinking about high strength materials that are strong and tough at the same time, you start realizing that that means that from a safety standpoint, I can achieve the same safety level, but I can do it with less material, right? So for a car or an airplane, that means better energy efficiency as well. It means better safety. And so all of a sudden, we start, start seeing dramatic shifts in those kinds of markets as well. And then when you start talking about corrosion, there was an interesting report that actually just got updated about a month ago from the National Association of Corrosion Engineers that estimates that, that as a nation, we spend about 4% of our gross domestic product addressing corrosion. So just on corrosion, right? Just trying to address the effects of corrosion on infrastructure, on automobiles, on major industry, we spend 4% of our gross domestic product. So imagine what we could do with that money <laughs> if, we, if we could extend the life of some of those corroding assets by 20 times. They, the, NACE, the NACE team also estimated that we're going to have to spend about $5 trillion, right, over the next seven years just trying to rehabilitate our existing infrastructure because of corrosion-based degradation. And um, I don't, I mean, if anybody's familiar with what's happening in Flint, right, Michigan, that's a corrosion phenomena. We're seeing the effects on health now as a result of corrosion. I don't know if anybody heard about what happened in the Bay Bridge about a month ago. There are pieces of the old part of the Bay Bridge that are now falling down, and they're discovering that that's because the, the infrastructure, the corrosion uh, resistance infrastructure underneath the concrete is actually failing. And so these are, these are big deals. They affect our lives. They affect our infrastructure. They affect trade in our, in our country as well as just, you know, sort of the infrastructure itself. So, um, so yeah, these are, this is a technology that could have a very big impact. And when you think about what materials-based technologies mean to us as a civilization, you start realizing that when you see shifts like this, where materials can do things that were not possible before, and can do that at a, in a cost-effective way, we not only see economic opportunities, but we see transitions in civilization. So we, it's interesting that we actually define transitions in civilization by the materials of manufacture. Right? There's the Stone Age, and there's a the Bronze Age, and there's a the Steel Age, and you know, I would argue someday there's an Aluminum Age, and then now this is like the Nano Age, and it's going to be all about monumental, right? <laughs> so, so, so you can get a sense perhaps, for why, for somebody like me, who is a physicist and a scientist, when this idea came along, I couldn't let go, right? Um, the, the genesis of the Modumental idea was actually an internal research project in another company that I ran. So Steve mentioned I had a company called Icetron. I co-founded with my dad. My, um, my background, the way that I got here to the University of Washington, was actually by a very circuitous route. So I started school on the East Coast. I had every intention when I first went to school of becoming a political science major. And then, like, it turns out there's not much science in political science, like, <laughs> at least not by <laughs> my definition of science. And, um, and so I became a physicist, and I got enamored with, um, with large-scale decontamination. So how, you know, how do we respond to really big environmental um, contamination phenomena? And of course, where do you go if you have that kind of obsession in life? But, Russia, this was the aftermath of the Chernobyl accident. So I actually went and did an internship in Russia and worked on large-scale remediation of soil and groundwater in the aftermath of the Chernobyl incident. And, um, and while I was there, started doing work in electrochemistry because it turns out electrochemistry is a really good way of sucking you know, heavy metals and contaminated metals out of the soil. And when I came back to the US, I said, you know, I want to keep doing that. I don't want to go back you know, study theoretical physics anymore. And it turns out there was a professor here at the University of Washington named Dan Schwartz who was doing research at Hanford on how to decontaminate radionuclides on very large scale. And so that's how I wound up here. I actually, before that, had spent a summer here learning Russian because it turned out to go to Russia, I had to learn Russian. <laughs> Seems logical. And, um, and as, as everybody probably knows here, if you come here for a summer, you sort of never want to leave. So I came here for a summer. I absolutely fell in love. I didn't know that there were places in the world where there is no humidity. There are no roaches here. You have no idea what a huge draw that is. And, and so I was like, this is civilization, and I am I'm coming back here, absolutely. And, um, and so, you know, so I came back. And I came back, and I 
pretty much stalked Professor Schwartz and said, I have to come and work with you. And he let me come and work with him you know, on an unpaid internship to just, just work in his lab. And, and that formed my future. Isotron, the company that I co-founded with my dad, did work in large-scale remediation of soil and groundwater, primarily looking at scenarios where you know, if there was a dirty bomb release in the US, how would we respond to it? Or if there was a nuclear contamination event, how would we respond to it? That sort of thing. And it was inside of that company that one of my, um, one of my researchers came up with this concept for Modumental. We were just doing research on the side. We had a, we had a, um, a, a rule that we could spend 10% of our time doing something totally outside of our core competency, right? Just, just really to foster kind of creativity inside of the team. And so this was one of our 10% projects. And when we discovered that, you know, this was possible, we said, oh my gosh, this could change the world. And, um, and we decided to see how far we could take it. And that's really where we are. And so, <laughs> here we go. This, this is where the SEC comes in. <laughs> okay. So the first thing we realized was, was if we really wanted to do something big, we had to have a goal, and we had to have a plan, and we had to have a plan that we believed in so much that there was no such thing as failure, right? And that's when I personally made the decision that I couldn't do two things. I couldn't do Isotron and, and do Modumental at the same time, so I had to make a choice. My co-founder had to make the same choice, and, and we decided that we were going to really make a go of it. We were really going to going to see how far we could take this technology. And that really meant how far can we take this technology, right? We knew we were going to make mistakes. We knew we were going to stumble along the way. But there was not going to be any such thing as failure. And I've, I've heard a lot of discussion about this concept of failing and failing fast. And you know, it's, it's important to embrace failure. Um, and I think failure, the, the, the definition of the term, is different for different people. I want to be really clear that like, you only fail if you don't get up after the last time you stumble, right? There's, this, there's a quote about this that, you know, it really, I don't believe that it's failure until you give up. And for us, there was no giving up. We, we were, we were going to define how far Modumental could go, and that meant all in. So that's it. We developed a plan, and we said, OK, well, we have to have a goal. Right? And we have to articulate that goal very simply so that every person that comes along in the company understands exactly what it is, and we're all on the same page. So it is very simply that we make nanolaminated materials. We make them for industrial scale applications, and we make them at a cost that's competitive with conventional metals. And that may sound really simple, right? but it means something very significant to every person in, this, in, in our company. So when we say we make nanolaminated materials, we mean we are making these materials for, for differentiated performance. We mean that the structure of the materials that we produce is actually really important to us. We don't make homogeneous alloys. We're not investigating the next new you know, kind of precipitation hardening phenomena. We make nanolayered materials. And we have to be excellent in making nanolaminated materials to be good at what we do. We make them for industrial scale applications. So that means that we do not make furniture for dollhouses. And that is a real thing that somebody has approached us about doing, and we've said no. And that was a really easy answer for every person in the company. right? Um, we don't make high performance jewelry. We make materials for industrial scale applications. And the reason that that was important to us is that we really want this technology to have an impact on those major economic uh, factors we talked about earlier. Right? And, and to do that as well, we have to make materials that are cost effective. And that means we're not replacing iron-based alloys with tungsten-based alloys. Right? We're not playing with the chemistry. We are really playing with the structure. We're taking the same old raw materials that are used today. We're architecting them differently. And we're making materials now that perform in quite a different way. Okay? So it sounds pretty simple, right? <laughs> so. Step number one, realize nanolaminated materials. There we go. You get a patent. Does anybody see a problem with this? <laughs> it's assigned to Delphi Technologies. <laughs> so the very first thing that happened to us was we discovered that we didn't actually invent the technology that we thought we invented. <laughs> right? It turns out there was a company called Delphi, which is the largest automotive component supplier in the world. 
they have something like 160,000 employees, a market cap of like 20 billion. They actually developed this process before we did. They beat us by a couple of years. And they developed the process for large scale manufacturing of lightweight components for the automotive industry. So we looked at that and said, shoot, <laughs> this is a problem, <laughs> right? But again, there wasn't, there wasn't gonna be failure for us. Like this, wasn't gonna, this was not gonna be defeat. So it turns out that at the same time we're starting the company, Delphi is going through bankruptcy, right? And what are the, I mean, you talk about luck. Like, okay, that, that was pretty lucky. And so we approached the bankruptcy court and we made a ridiculous offer that we'll only ever, we'll only ever tell that story like, you know, after we go public. But um, I don't know why this keeps doing this. But yeah, I mean, so we bought it. We bought the patent. So we now own the patent. We actually own the portfolio, um, the technology. And, and that, that got us to step one, right? <laughs> so we could realize these nanolaminated materials. It turns out it was even more complicated than that because Delphi had developed the technology and then subsequent to them, the Department of Energy had started researching with their process and had developed a whole class of alloys. So we actually had to go on an acquisition spree. And Delphi was easy. The Department of Energy buying patents from the Department of Energy took us three years. So we had, we had a group of investors, WRF was one of our investors, that, that took a risk with us, that said, hey, we really think these guys can do this, right? But there was, there was you know, question as to whether the IP portfolio was even gonna come together. So that, that first one you know, wasn't, wasn't necessarily a given. And, and the next was industrial applications, and you look at that and you say, okay, well, that, that's a pretty broad definition, right? Um, it turns out that when we first got started, there really wasn't any such thing as industrially relevant nanolaminated materials. So I talked a lot about what had been demonstrated with nanolayered materials. Most of it had been demonstrated for the purposes of some kind of academic dissertation. And most of those phenomena, kohler toughening and phonon scattering and materials and galvanic coupling had been proven in model systems. So they weren't industrially relevant alloys. They were like, copper nickel alloys and nickel iron alloys and things that you would never actually deploy in the field, but you could prove some kind of basic phenomenon with. So we actually had to go out and develop the materials and prove them out in specific industries. And so we did that all across the board. We developed thermal barrier materials with GE and Rolls-Royce. We developed structural alloys. We worked with Boeing. We worked with Apple. We worked in the oil and gas sector on corrosion resistant materials. We worked in the construction sector. We looked at different types of corrosion, different types of materials. We did a lot of contract research and development. And we, we developed a whole portfolio of alloys. And it was great. We had a team of really phenomenal researchers. And we were doing contract research and development. We actually generated revenue doing these kinds of collaborative research projects. And then we realized Dan Rosen was my first board member. And he said, Christina, let me tell you something. You're afraid of starvation. You need to be afraid of indigestion, right? You cannot be excellent at a lot of things. You have to be excellent at one thing and earn the right to do all the others. And so we had to go through a really tough process as a company of focusing, right? of really narrowing down exactly what we were gonna do in terms, of, in terms of product development, in terms of bringing this technology to market, in terms of bringing it to industrial scale because there was absolutely no way that at the time, you know, 20 people were gonna be able to take over the world by taking over the entire world all at once. And so that was really hard. We actually had to downsize the team. We had to focus our technology and this all sounds very thoughtful and like there was a natural progression to it. It was pretty disruptive to us to have to say, put that technology on the shelf. As a researcher, you get really attached to your baby and to its capabilities and its potential. And so, but we had to do that as a company if we were gonna realize that vision, that mission that we had set out to achieve. And so we did. Um, we, we basically 
downsized and said, okay, this is gonna be all about corrosion, right? And that's still a really big thing. Remember I said I think 4% of the gross domestic product of the United States, so it turns out that corrosion means different things to different people. And so we even had to focus further and we had to look very specifically at places where we could realize that vision of being cost competitive. We had to look at places where adoption was most likely because corrosion was defining uh, an industry. And we decided to focus in on, on the oil and gas sector, on corrosion in what's called topsides corrosion, so basically marine corrosion on fasteners, on tubulars, and on pumps and valves. So very, very, very narrow. So we started out with sort of this really broad view of let's develop the technology. You know, if we build it, they will come to, we are very specifically gonna serve the need of this industry, and that's what we do today. So somebody asked me earlier if we make commercial products. If you go on our website, you can buy nuts, bolts, screws. <laughs> that's what we make. And it probably doesn't sound all that sexy, but it's really, really sexy. Like, it, it turns out that we buy a lot of bolts, right, as a nation, and they corrode. And there's a lot of labor involved in replacing bolts in industrial environments. And so if we can do nothing else but realize that 20 times performance in, in this one industry, we can make this company successful, right? And so that's what we do. We, we make fasteners. It turns out we make some tubulars too, so if you go on the website, you can also buy tubulars, but they're very specific to the oil and gas industry, so I doubt that you will want to be putting those in your backyard. But if you have a deck project, best screws in the world, <laughs> right? And so, um, and so that, that was going really well. It turns out there's a lot more challenge to this to just this focus um, that, I'm, that I'm letting on because these are industrial markets that have been doing the same thing literally for hundreds of years. So I mentioned the most commonly used corrosion resistant alloy in the world is galvanizing, which is zinc. You put zinc on steel, and it's a great corrosion protector. And there's an ASTM standard for corrosion protection, ASTM A123 or A153, depending on what you're coding. They have been around forever. If you go and participate in an ASTM standard meeting, you'll find out that there are a whole bunch of lawyers that sit in on those committees that are there to protect market share, right? They don't want new technologies to get introduced. So we now have the challenge of introducing these new technologies into markets that have never done anything any different for literally 100 years. Think has been around for a really long time. And we have to convince them to change, right? And so. We started working in the standards uh, organizations. Several of my team members now sit on committees. They chair committees. I'm on the board of ASTM. We're really trying to help the industry change the way it thinks about innovation, because this is not an industry that innovates frequently, right? But and the, at the same time, we realize that we have to start scaling up manufacturing, because to get through that qualification process, we actually have to make parts, and we actually have to feel parts, and we actually have to see them perform in the field. And so we start manufacturing. And we start putting stuff in the field, and these are real bolts, and we actually put them in that industrial environment. And I could probably spend the next hour like going through photos of parts that have been in the field and how they corrode and stuff like that. But, but the bottom line is they really work. Right? And so we had gotten to the point as a company where we had quality systems in place, we had scaled up manufacturing, we were putting parts in the field. And then on May 4th, 2013, our production facility burned down. So opening day of boating season, we were, our first production facility was on Lake Union, so which is where our R&D facility is located. And we had just, just started the scale up process and you probably read about it in the news. Um, the facility caught fire, a uh, piece of equipment malfunctioned, the rooftop caught on fire, there was billowing black smoke all over Lake Union all day long, and that was the end of our manufacturing facility, right? And again, that's when, <laughs> that's when you sit down and say, holy mackerel, okay. <laughs> you know, nobody would follow me if I said enough, right? Time out. But, 
it, it's hard. It's really hard, right? So we, we sat down with the team. And, and I'll tell you, we're a manufacturing facility literally on Lake Union. So we were on a floating barge, you know, a platform, basically. The old pieces of I-90 are part of the North Lake shipyard. And, um, and one of our facilities was partially located on one of those old pieces of, of I-90. And so not only did we burn the facility down, but we had every single environmental regulator in the city, the state, sitting with us trying to figure out if we had contaminated anything, right? So we're sitting on a super fun site. The, all of Gas Works in the facility that we're on is already an EPA super fun site. We had fortunately built the facility with safety in mind. That's always been you know, important to us. And so we had, we had a triple berm system. The requirement in the city was a double berm. We actually had three. We breached the first two berms in the system. The third berm was actually the one that held because there was so much water used in putting out the fire that they wound up. It was, it was actually the fire water. We, ha we, were, we are responsible for containing the fire, you know, the fire suppression water. And, um, and in the end, everything worked out great. But, but there, were, you know, there were days where it was, it, there was a question as to whether this was going to be the end of this venture. Right? This was going to be our defining moment. And we just said, no, no dice. So we flew a team down to Houston, because of course we had, we had customers that were waiting for parts. And we said, it's your job to figure out a new schedule, to sit down with them, to try to figure out how we mitigate any issues, any impact on their schedules. And they went off. We had our team at, at North Lake here at uh, the facility. Um, one team that was responsible for trying to get some level of manufacturing up and running in our lab, <laughs> right? And we had another team that was responsible for finding a new facility. And all of that had to happen at once. And the team is amazing, right? I mean, this, this, this is a team sport. Entrepreneurship is a team sport. You'll see that in a bit. But, but it also takes a whole lot of guts. And we, didn't, we knew that wasn't going to be our defining moment. We knew that, right? And we weren't going to let it be. And so we did recover. We had, you know, I had team members that literally lived on site trying to get facilities up and running. One of my employees had her first child during all of this. And she jokes to this day that he was basically raised in a construction site because he was there every single day you know, while we were trying to build up the facility. But we got it done. And that's the team. And that is the new production facility. And we are currently operating um, now in Snohomish County, a 30,000 square foot facility where we produce large, large format components uh, at, high, at high throughput. So if you buy fasteners for us, they will come off of our high throughput fastener line. Um, and there it is. And this is actually what it looks like from a bird's eye view. So, so we're there. <laughs> one more step, right? And the one thing I'll say is it, it is a team sport. And, um, and I think one, the one thing I've learned, so I started this venture as a scientist, and I thought it was all about the technology, right? If we develop the technology right, everything was going to be fine, right? It turns out that's not it. It's all about the team. It is all about getting a group of people to collaborate with you. And by a team, I mean this group that I go to work with every single day. Um, they, are the, the, they are the ones that are realizing the vision we've set forth. They are the ones that are going to change the world. They are the ones that are going to realize nanolaminated alloys in industrial applications at a cost that's competitive with conventional alloys. I mean the investors that have, that have taken a risk with us and said, you know, maybe this will be the next age of manufacturing, as unlikely as it is. We're, really, we're willing to support you despite the fact that you know, we've been through so many hurdles of a technology that wasn't really ours when we started, of a manufacturing facility that has burned down to an industry that, you know, has all kinds of obstacles in the way of even getting to, to sales, right? Um, and, and customers that have engaged with us um, wholeheartedly, right, despite the challenges that they face as well. So it's all of that together. And, it's exciting for me to see that start coming together, far more exciting really at this point than the technology itself. The technology is kind of a, it's like, it's like my dog, right? You know, I sort of take it for granted at this stage. But the team and the dynamic in the team and the culture of the team and how we're going to build that, 
That's really the exciting part. So there we are. <laughs> we're, we're still in the midst of the journey, right? And you know, beyond corrosion-resistant materials, we have aspirations, too, of what the future look, look, looks like. We keep reminding ourselves we live every day in the, uh, in the sexy corrosion market, <laughs> right? We have a whole room that's dedicated to corrosion in, in our office that has all of our corrosion chambers. We, we joke it's like Florida in a box. We had to isolate it because it was corroding everything else in the office space. And, um, and so we all live that every day. And if you need inspiration, you just go open the salt fog chamber and go look inside and see our nanolaminated materials and it will galvanize. But there's also a vision of what comes next. So the automotive industry, the aerospace industry, the energy industry, you know, and beyond. So, so we're just at the start. We're not a legend yet, <laughs> but we're getting there. So thank you. Yeah. I have one more quote, right? <laughs> a little insanity is necessary, too. <laughs> I'm going to start with the first question. Sure. You're all supposed to ask questions, too. I'm going to get sick of the sound of my own voice. But, uh, Christina, would you consider, I don't know what the word would be, franchising your technology to other, to some of those other industries? Or are you going to try to retain the? So yeah. So we... Um, one thing we're really careful about is we innovate in materials. We are not innovating in business model, right? So we, we keep reminding ourselves that we are, we are trying to be disruptive when it comes to the types of materials that we produce. But to the extent that we can pattern match the way the industry buys today, the better off we are. So in some industries, that necessarily means licensing the technology. Um, an example of that, we actually publicly announced a partnership with Steel Dynamics to license our technology for sheet metal applications. In the sheet metal industry, there's a lot of vertical integration. So companies that produce sheet metal typically galvanize on their own. Um, they own either hot dip galvanizing or electric galvanizing facilities within their asset base. So the idea that some new technology is going to come along and we're just going to disrupt that model is not likely. Um, and so we, we actually will, in that case, necessarily license the technology to companies that are already electric galvanizing or hot dip galvanizing. So, yeah. So, so you know, there are different ways of ruling the world, right? Sometimes you, you have to partner to do it. So we're all for it. Professor Wells. Bill, do you see yourself at some point in time in the future becoming a public company as opposed to a privately held company. And if you do, when do you expect that? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> before I answer that question, I want to tell a little story about, about Professor Wells. So I, I came to the University of Washington um, to study physics, as I mentioned, to you know, study with Professor Schwartz. And, and I will say, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Bill Wells, right? I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I would not have been in a position to start a company if it hadn't been for Bill. I, um, I have actually had other engineers that wanted to start companies, and we've been very supportive of, of that. And I've told them all, you have to take financial accounting, and if you can find Bill Wells, like, go take that class. Okay, because you really have to learn how to like read an income statement and a balance sheet. And you have to know what it means. I learned so much in that class, and I will say, and I'm not just saying this because you're here. I wouldn't be able to do my job if it hadn't been for that class. I would have been lost. So, it, you know, for the students that are here, if you're thinking about starting a company, a technology company, the technology is important. The accounting is essential. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, <laughs> So thank you very much. In terms of going public, um, we have investors that want to generate a return on their investment, right? And so we, we recognize that somehow we have to achieve liquidity for our investors. Um, and for what we are trying to do, it's highly unlikely that we're going to get acquired by somebody and realize the kind of, the kind of you know, value or return the kind of value we want to return to our investors. So. <clears throat> that means there is a high likelihood that we would go public. That said, you know, we, we want to stay private as, as long as we can. It's, it's hard anymore for companies to really grow when they're public um, and really make the kinds, you know, the kinds of investments we will need to make um, in, in growth 
as a publicly traded company. That doesn't mean that you can't. It just means that, you know, as an entrepreneur, I sort of want to kick that can down the road as long as I can. But then I think Loretta's like, yeah, OK. <laughs> Sooner is better. So <laughs> yeah. Can you give some background on what you've done for fundraising, what the time frame around your different rounds has been, and at what point you expect to actually break even? I'm assuming you're not there. Yeah, so we, yeah, we're not, we have, we just actually just announced that we raised a round of financing last year, and we're still, we're still building out manufacturing, so we're, we're basically, you know, growing and building out the manufacturing base as we're trying to build our sales, so it means that we need the cash in order to, to be able to, uh, to reach that break-even point. Um, we have, so we actually, we started out, um, back in 2007, we raised angel financing. So our first round of financing um, was an angel round. We don't disclose like total round sizes. I think people pull documents off of the SEC web website that, and they make estimates. So I'll let them make the estimates. But, um, but just in terms of the progression, we raised an angel round of financing. And like I said, that was actually even before we had secured all of the intellectual property. Um, our next round of financing, um, we raised, and we raised it over a period of time, um, largely around this kind of focusing period. So as we, as we transitioned from doing contract manufacturing or contract research and development and started moving into sort of the, the focused product development, we raised more financing then. And now the financing that we just recently raised is more about product deployment. So it's about building out manufacturing facilities. I will mention, I mean, I've got lots of great challenge stories. We started raising our round of financing in early 2014, or late 2014, rather, right before OPEC made their announcement, so it was before November. <clears throat> and our primary target market was oil and gas industry. And I think, actually, I jinxed the industry because I made the statement as we were getting ready to raise the financing, like, there's a lot of risk in our venture because of the specification challenges we, we face. But man, there's no risk in this market. I mean, it's you know like, there. And then we raised the financing in like the worst possible condition for the market that we were targeting, and um, and and again, that was another one where it was not really clear if we were even going to get that financing to close because we're focused on growing in an industry that is like, you know, basically fallen off the map. And, um, and we wound up raising that financing with um, a lead investor out of Silicon Valley that was our very first choice. Like, they were the ones that we really wanted to have participate in the, um, in the venture, which it's a group called the Founders Fund. And, um, and then a lot of our customers, so Chevron BP, ConocoPhillips, uh, and two groups out of the Middle East actually invested in the company as well. And they were all groups that had been customers of our products and then, you know, basically decided to become equity investors. So, so it wound up okay. But it was, it, was, it was not a pretty process. <laughs> yes? I'm, I'm curious as to your choice to invest in an industry that you said is inherently uh, resistant to change rather than an industry like the you know, aircraft industry, which is always embracing new technology and looking for new ways to be lighter and faster. And you know, when you talk about the, the turboprop applications, you talk about the strength applications, the corrosion, it just seems like it would have been possibly more natural. And I don't know if there was a barrier to not thinking that. Yeah, um, it's all a matter of perception. So we actually went through and did analysis of adoption cycles for different industries. Um, so there are two things. First of all, the aerospace industry, while it is an industry that embraces technology, it embraces technology exceedingly slowly. So in fact, it would have taken longer to get qualified as a material solution within the aerospace industry than in the oil and gas industry. But the other thing that was important to us and part of the reason that in, in any industrial market, um, we are dealing with spec-based sales. So the issue is that all of these industries, aerospace, automotive, you know, oil and gas, um, you name it, like construction, they are all spec-based sales. And it's the spec process that takes the longest. And it's the spec process where there's a whole lot of protection around the specification because that's that is basically where market share gets preserved, and um, and so we looked at where is the incentive going to be the greatest to take on that challenge. And in the oil and gas industry in particular, 
Corrosion is a big problem, and corrosion is a big problem because it affects return on investment. So the dynamic in the oil and gas industry is one of corrosion is actually getting worse. More and more sour wells are being produced, so that means the environment for the corrosion is actually more aggressive. And the industry is trying to move to more cost effectiveness, and even more so now even than when we started in the industry. And, and yet it's being challenged by this corrosion phenomenon. If you can address corrosion, it directly affects return on investment calculations. And so we looked at that and said, okay, those guys, the end user of that technology, is going to be the one that's going to benefit the most. And they're, they are going to be driven to work with us to try to overcome the specification challenge. So that's effectively what we did. And when we started that strategy, we didn't know anybody in Chevron. We didn't know anybody at BP. We didn't, like, we didn't have any connections. We just said, hey, that looks like the right place to go. So we actually had to go and cultivate all the relationships within the end user com community. There was a lot of push to kind of work through the middle market, which we felt like from a strategic standpoint wasn't the right way, way to go. That's worked to our advantage because right now, there's a pull now from the end user community to try to help get through that, that specification process. But, um, but it, yeah, it, I mean, it really was like systematically we looked at different, at different industries. And there isn't any silver bullet. Like, there's not one you can look at and say, oh, they don't have any specs. It doesn't happen. The good news in that process is that once you're on the back side of the spec process, it's actually a bigger barrier to entry than like any patent we could, we could ever file for, right? So it, it, you know, it, it, there's an advantage to it on the back side, but getting through it is a pretty painful process. So. I have a question um, about uh, just how you handle conflict internally. So Steve Jobs, Bear Bryant, very iconic, very strong leaders, right? So where does the buck stop? And when there is a conflict deciding about um, markets or technologies to pursue, how does that play out internally in oh. your team philosophy? Um, really good question. Very timely question. Um, <laughs> it, it's hard. That part is hard, right? On the one hand, we are one team, and we we all have to we all have to be you know together in in the in the vision, in pursuing the vision. We have to believe in it and so forth. Um, but at the end of the day, entrepreneurship and corporate ventures are not democracies, right? There's one person that's in charge. Um, and that's a lonely job, right? I mean, I, I started this company with my friends. We were all peers, we were buddies, you know, it was very different kind of dynamic. And it's different now, it's very different now. Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, a lot of times we're making decisions with imperfect information. There are lots of ways we can challenge the data. You know, especially when you're talking about things like specification cycles, there isn't a model. You can't go out and say, well, somebody else did it before, we'll just follow in their footsteps. And so, you know, in, in terms of my style and my approach, I would say I'm still learning, <laughs> okay? But we try to engage in the dialogue all together. And once we've made a decision, we're, we're either all together behind it or we have to, you know, we have to ch make changes. And we've had to let people go and we've had team members that have had to leave because they didn't agree. But that's the reality of this kind of venture, right? We all have to be moving in the, in the same direction or it's never going to work. So good, very good question. There's somebody in the back that's, <laughs> yes. I'm interested in your <coughs> recommendations and learnings about teamwork. You said it's so important. Yeah. So if someone's going to put together a team and then as that changes, as that dynamic happens, how do you keep them together? Yeah, um, so that's actually something that we've, we've had to struggle with directly because the, um, the focus of our team changed dramatically from really a research-focused fo organization when we first started to now a manufacturing organization. And our cultural values haven't changed, right? It's, it's still about, it's about competence, it's about integrity, it's about rigor, it's about inspiration. Like, those are the things that we value. And, um, and yet, how that manifests is dramatically different. Like, when you talk about inspiration, so when we talk about inspiration, there's a second definition in the dictionary which says inspiration is the product of creativity and action, right? And so those two things we think are important. When you talk about creativity 
in a research environment, in creativity, in a production environment, those are two very different things, right? And creating a team that kind of reflects that set of values and that still has very, very different functions is hard to do. And we're trying to do that. We have, we have two different sites. You know, frankly, we have two different organizations that operate very differently. But I think the culture is still consistent. Like when we get together, we still value the same things. We just value them in different ways. And so, you know, the teamwork is different. The kind of collaboration is different. But I hope in the long run, the kind of the overarching culture stays the same. And, um, and I, would say, I would say that's still something that we're trying to you know, perfect. We will forever be trying to perfect that. But, um, but um, this is a long-winded way of saying there's not one answer to that question. It really, it really depends on how the teamwork is manifest. But defining what the culture means to the, you know, to the company and what it, what it really is and staying true to that is absolutely critical. We, we talk about as a team, so we, we've actually gone through several exercises and we constantly do this where we talk about, you know, what are we all about, right? We're a mission-focused organization and that means something to us. It means that we're looking for employees that are gonna stay with us for the long run, right? This isn't like a software startup. We're not, we can't afford to churn through employees. We don't have a two-year gestation period. You know, we're in it really for the long haul. So. There's, there's this aspect of a mission focus that's really important to the company. And so defining what the culture is and continuing to grow, that's really important. And so, so we've looked at examples like Walt Disney. We, we actually, the Marine Corps is like a big, um, I've studied a lot about that team dynamic and how that esprit de corps got developed and how it's endured. But we're trying to model those types of, those types of cultures that can really last you know, beyond one generation. So. So I love some of the um, environmental goals that you set out with your with the new product and all of that. And it's really lofty environmental goals. Are you at all conflicted? Is the team conflicted with the choice of working in the gas and oil industry, or how do you see uh, your your environmental goals being reached through working through the uh, the gas and oil industry? Well, I think from, from our perspective, first of all, the oil and gas industry is a reality. Like I, you know, I have a car that runs on gasoline and, and I fill up my car every day and, um, and drive into work. And so it's, it's a reality. I, um, I've always been a firm believer that the best way to impact change is to look at really big industries and try to figure out ways of making them more efficient or making them cleaner. And so I think to us, we look at that and say, we can actually make oil and gas production more efficient. We also look at the fact that the fourth largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world is the metals industry, and we're trying to make that industry more efficient. So I think from an environmental standpoint, you know, we, um, we could have gone after the battery industry. We actually do some work in the wind industry, but the impact of the technology in those sectors is so small compared to the impact that we can have in oil and gas or in any industrial, existing industrial sector application that we, we're really inspired by, you know, by where we're focused because, because, of, the, because of the scale of the impact we can have. Um, and I think, you know, personal opinion, like I think that's really, it's an important consideration for, for all of us as we think about the environment and we think about, you know, the impact that we have on the environment. We may not like oil and gas, but it's there. I mean, it is, it is the most commonly used fuel in transportation, and it, you know, it has an impact on this environment. And if we can do anything to impact its efficiency or its cleanliness, it's going to have a dramatic you know, secondary impact on the world. So, so I'm, I'm actually really proud that we're, you know, that we're focused on this problem and, and generally that we're making some progress. So. Hi, so what are some advice that you can give to aspiring entrepreneurs that are working to start their own business? Wow. <laughs> um, I, I would, you know, I would, so first of all, I didn't start this company because I was aspiring to become an entrepreneur, right? I, I found my problem and I couldn't let go of it. And it, you know, it became an obsession and it became a passion and, 
and I feel really privileged in life that that happened, like that I found my problem. Um, so I would say look for your problem, right? And then once you find it, don't ever let go. Don't ever let go, right? Because it is, despite all the things I've shared, like the challenges that we face, and it's really fun to look back because we have the benefit of having overcome those challenges, but living through them was really hard. Um, it, at the same time, like on the worst possible day, like the day after the fire, even the day of the fire, like you can't imagine what it's like. So we, we had a, a fire alarm system that was constantly malfunctioning, right? And I'm number one on the call list when the fire alarm goes off. So I can't tell you how many times I drove down to the office and there was like nothing going on and I had to let the fire department in and walk around. And I fully expected, this was a Saturday when the fire happened, I fully expected to drive down and have this be another false alarm. Drove down 13 fire trucks and the building was on fire. And I will never forget that moment, like when I realized, holy mackerel, I couldn't even get my car in my own parking lot, right? And it was a horrible moment, right? And the next morning when I woke up, another, you know, not so great day, I still woke up, you know, five o'clock in the morning inspired by the day, right? There's just nothing about, nothing like the feeling that, hey, I own my problems, I am inspired by what I'm trying to accomplish, and I think, you know, when you find that problem and when you find that passion, you'll know that, right? And you should not let any challenge stop you once you've figured that out. That would be my advice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'd say absolutely inspiring, but you've used that word so much <laughs> that, that I'm inspired. So uh, thank, you. thank you so much for... for a very uh, uh, sexy, uh, <laughs> I was going to quote you on a number of words here, but uh, again, I don't want to take uh, uh, the, the time. On behalf of the Foster School of Business and the University of Washington, we were absolutely honored to have you here today and just like to give you this token of Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.